Uh, we are in our series on, entitled Ready. Matter of fact, we are at the very end of it. We've been going through First and Second Thessalonians for the past several months, and we are come to the very end of Second Thessalonians. And, and Paul is finishing this letter off. And when I think of this letter, it reminds me of the story that I heard several years ago about a woman named Florence Chadwick. Now, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with her, but uh, this woman was an amazing swimmer. And she had actually swam, from, uh, swam the English Channel, which is a pretty big trek. And she decided she wanted to swim from the Catalina Island in uh, California to the mainland, which was a 26-mile trek. Uh, I mean, across the water, across the Pacific, something that no woman had ever done before. And she started off in the just bright at the day, just as the sun was coming up, and she had boats around her just to ensure her safety, and she swam. And hour after hour, she just kept swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming. But then, the, you know, the sun went down, the darkness came in, and in California, especially uh, right around where that's at, that fog began to roll in, so thick that she could barely see. And so she kept swimming and swimming. Finally, she just said, you know what? I quit. I can't do it anymore. Pull me out. So they pulled her out of the water, and they said, why couldn't you keep on going? She goes, because I couldn't see anymore. I, I, I couldn't see where I was going. And she was so disheartened. I mean, she'd swim for 15 hours and 55 minutes. That's how long she'd been swimming. It was an incredible long time. And she was disheartened to learn she was only a half mile from the coast. But she couldn't finish because she couldn't see in front of her face. So two months later, she decided to try it again. And this time, she was resolute. And she started to swim, and she swam. And she had the boats around her again, beautiful sun, clear day. She swam, she swam on, and again, the fog came in. This time, even worse than it was the first time. And she couldn't even see her hand in front of her face as she was swimming and swimming and swimming. But she, finally, she was so determined that she swam, swam, swam. She got there. She beat the world record by two and a half hours. It was incredible. And they said, well, what, what made you keep going this time? She goes, because I kept a mental picture in my mind. Even when the fog set in, it was worse than it was before, but I kept a mental picture in my mind of what the finish would be like. And I knew that I knew to finish well. And, I, you know, I think about that for the Christian life. There's going to be times when we start off with the Lord, and it's great. It's clear skies. Everything seems to be going right. People are around us cheering us on. But then the fog of circumstance, trouble, trials come in, temptations come at us. We can't see in front of our face. We can't very, get a very good perspective. And some people say, I'm done. It's too hard. I can't do this anymore. It's, it started off, it seemed like it was easy. I had all the energy. And, and you meet people that are, they just come to know Christ and they're so excited and everything's praise the Lord and it's great and it's wonderful. But there, there are times where it comes in and, and it starts getting into the difficult parts of life and how you handle your money and how do you handle your, your marriage and your spouse, your relationship with your kids and how do you deal with, with people that disagree with you and how do you deal with your own temptations that are within your own heart and, and it becomes, some people feel like it's restricted restrictive and, and they don't want to do it anymore and they say, I quit. But see, what God is showing us is that, you know what? Keep in your mind what's at the end because I'm coming again. And, and don't think about the circumstances around you, but press on and finish well. And Paul is writing to us. He's finishing this letter and he's writing to the Thessalonians, encouraging them to finish well because they face temptations. They face struggles. They face trials and tribulations. And remember, this church is a fledgling church. It's a startup church. It's a plant that Paul himself had planted. And he didn't have a great plan on how to go about it. He hadn't assessed the community and known what was going on and how did this wonderful plan. He'd had some time of instruction of them and sharing with them in their homes over a short amount of time. But remember, he got ran out of that community and he didn't know what was going on. And, and he sees that their faith is growing, but they had a lot of questions and they were struggling and they had some misunderstandings of the second coming of Christ. And he wrote the first letter to help correct them on some of their misunderstanding and the false doctrine and teaching that it was beginning to creep in. And he wanted to address that. But now he's, he's finishing this letter saying, keep Keep on. Finish well. You're doing great. Don't lose your, the sight of what is at the end of the finish line, that there's a prize that awaits you. And this letter is not just for them, it's but for us. Because we're getting, I know that many of us, and speaking to so many different people, I know that people are tired. There are some of you that are struggling in very, just difficulty in your Christian walk. You're having a hard time seeing God. 
And there's others of us that are here that are struggling in their marital relationship right now, that they, they have a spouse that just isn't loving them and taking care of them and treating them well. And there's others that are dealing with a wayward child, and, and they're just like, I just want them out. I can't take them anymore. They're driving me crazy, and they seem to be at their proverbial end of their rope. And there's, there's others that are just struggling going through their job and doing the day-to-day, and they're wondering where God is at in the middle of it. And this word today that we're going to see is for each one of us, that God is encouraging us to keep on, to finish well, to fight through it. And I am convinced in the depth of my bones that a great deal of the Christian life is not dealing with the miraculous, but it's dealing with the mundane. It's not not seeing the deliverance, because God does bring deliverance, but it's learning how to die in the everyday. I mean, everyone wants deliverance, but not a lot of people want discipleship. And what he's showing us and giving us are the the tenets of discipleship. How to live, how to finish well. So if you are struggling and you are weary, then this word is for you today. That Paul and God especially wants to speak to you, to encourage your heart, to keep on keeping on for his glory and your joy. But before we go any further, let's pray, asking him to bless our time together. Father, we come before you right now as as hungry and needy children, asking you to feed us, to teach us, to instruct us. Lord, so many people are weary, they're tired. And just like Florence Chadwick, Lord, we're swimming along and, and it just seems like we can't go on. But Lord, show us that there may not be that much further to go. Lord, you could come tomorrow. You could come right now. You could come in a month or a week or a year. But Lord, show us that that you and remind us that you are coming again and that this momentary affliction is nothing compared to what awaits awaits us in glory. So Lord, Lord, please be with us now. Instruct us and use us for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's jump right in to our text, shall we? We are in verse... 13. Now Paul begins with, he says, as for you brothers, remember he is speaking to them. They are part of the family of God now. They are united. We, and this is why the early church, by the way, many people was felt it was incestuous because people were cons- calling each one another brother and sister and they would greet one another with a holy kiss. I mean, he, they, they thought they were a family and they are, but not in the physical sense, in the spiritual sense. So Paul is writing to them and he says, as for you brothers, Brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. See, he'd grown to love this little startup church, and he knew how draining ministry could be. He knew how difficult it was for them because they were facing persecution. And many people in these churches, you would see one spouse would come to know the Lord and another one didn't. Or maybe your employer came to know the Lord and you didn't. Or an employee came to the Lord and you didn't. So it changed the dynamic of relationships, and it brought a friction there. And he's saying that don't grow weary Keep on doing well. People might be going against you, and you might have struggles in the church, might have struggles in your family, but press on when times are tough. That's the first point that he wants us to take away from this that I want you to write down. He wants us to press on when times are tough. And the theologians in the 16th century called this the perseverance of the saints, that if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, a sure sign that you are a believer is that you will persevere until the end of your Christian walk. See, many of us think that we just pray the prayer, we're good, we don't have to do anything else. That's not it. That's not it at all. Again, we have seen that time and time again through the scriptures that they called it the way. It's a pathway. It's a life. After we trust in Christ, it's a movement of our life in totality toward Christ. We persevere on until the end. We have to cross that finish line. I had a classmate. uh, His name was Mikey Kingry. Mikey Kingry uh, used to run track, was a talented athlete. This guy could eat five or six sticker bars right before a game, still play great, didn't affect him at all. No matter what rule that there was on what you had to eat or how to take care of your body, he violated. And he still managed to be this amazing athlete. And he was running track. And he was, he, it was a two-mile race. And he starts off and he's blowing away the competition. He's making his way around the track. People are cheering him on. And then right before the last lap, he stops, walks over to the high jump pit, and falls down in it. And people are running over, are you okay? Are you okay? He goes, yeah, I was just tired. I didn't want to run anymore. 
See, it doesn't matter how great you were starting off. I mean, he just, he just quit. See, many of us, we might see people that are running the race, they're running a race, but we've got to get to the end of the line. And there are so many people that we see that seem to have great ministries and they're disqualified right before the end because they just walk away from the faith. That's what so many have done. And Paul's saying, no, press on when times are tough. Paul understood that. He had gone through some tough times. We have to understand that when we call people to follow Jesus Christ, that not every problem is going to be removed. Not every struggle is going to be removed from them. Matter of fact, they might intensify. Elton Trueblood, a great gospel minister, said this. Occasionally, we talk about our Christianity as something that solves problems. And I've seen that. We see these TV evangelists and preachers get up, and they say that Jesus will solve all your problems. And it's true to an extent. He solves all of our problems. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get more problems in return. Because when you start following Jesus, that's going to bring other problems in your relationships. He says that. He, he goes on. And there is a sense in which it does solve all of our problems. Long before it does so, however, it increases both the number and the intensity of the problems. Even our intellectual questions are increased by the acceptance of a strong religious faith. And if a man wishes to avoid the disturbing effect of paradoxes, the best advice is, is for him to leave the Christian faith alone. And what he means by that is this. As you come to know Jesus, it's going to cause other problems. It's going to cause frictions. It's going to cause friction in your interpersonal relationships, possibly with your spouse or with your children. As you seek to follow the Lord, you're going to make changes in your life. And other people aren't going to like those changes because they like the status quo. They like things as they are, and they don't like to feel conviction. And so they're going to remove you. They're going to try to, try to bring you down. They're going to criticize you. They're going to try to make fun of you. And it's going to cause some frictions. It's going to cause some trouble in your life. But we're to press on. Times will get tougher when you choose to follow Jesus, as Paul himself said. Let me lay this out. Paul, if you remember right, Paul was a scholar of the first degree. This guy has got Harvard, MIT, Ivy League, best schools, Rhodes Scholar for the religious realm. That's Paul. He is the top, the cream of the crop, and yet he is riding high. He, is, he has got it, the path set before him. He'd studied under some of the best scholars. People knew who he was. He's an up-and-comer of the religious elite, and that's when he comes to know Jesus, and things take a dramatic turn. And rather than getting cr the crown, if you will, he gets the cane on the back. I mean, this is what starts happening. Paul says how he's gone through. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. He's given an example of his life here. He says, with far greater labors. This is what I've gone through for the name of Jesus. Far more imprisonments. He's been in prison with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, all because of his testimony of Jesus. Once I was stoned, the rocks were thrown at him until he would, he would die, but he ended up not dying. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. I've been on frequent journeys, in danger on the rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own, country, my own people, my own countrymen. And not only that, I'm danger from Gentiles too. They can't stand me. I'm danger in the city. I'm in danger in the wilderness. I'm in danger at sea. I'm in danger from false brothers trying to infiltrate the church in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to fall and I'm not indignant? He's saying that, you know what? I'm following Jesus. I'm doing what God has called me to do. And I'm willing to suffer. And I have suffered. And not only that, but I'm, I'm carrying these fledgling startup churches who are struggling with all kinds of sexual immorality. False teachers are trying to get in. I've got abuse of the spiritual gifts over here. I've got people that have left their love behind for God here, and I'm trying to just live my own life. It's a struggle. Paul, you see here, and he is very human. He is struggling just like we are. And yet he's saying to us, press on. It's well worth the prize. Give up, and what you get is so far greater. Press on in the face of all this hostility. He knew they would get tired, which is why he says to them and us, do not grow weary 
in doing good. That's back in our text. Do not grow weary in doing good. Now the Greek word here for weary means to be, and I love this word, means to be worn out, exhausted, spiritless, faint, weak, and carries the idea of fatigue that leads to negative outcome because of an action done. In other words, they're doing all this good and they're getting weary and fatigued because they, they keep giving out and they're not giving back. And they're not getting back. And they're exhausted emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Paul knew that better than anybody else what that was like. He'd, been, he'd gone through that, and he wanted to make sure that them and us, that we press on when we encounter, first of all, difficulty. Now, these are the things that you're going to encounter. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is what Paul is saying to them, that I want you to press on when you encounter difficulty. I know what it's like to face difficulty. I know what it's like to be rejected. This isn't just uh, cookies and ice cream, right? This is, this is tough. This is a struggle, and I want you to know that. But you're going to be victorious in the end when you encounter difficulty because it's going to be hard. As Christians, we are guaranteed, guaranteed to experience opposition. If you're encountering any type of preacher, evangelist, teacher, or pastor who stands up and says only positive things about you and what God wants to give you, then you need to run because they're, not, they're failing to teach the full counsel of God's word. They're poaching verses. Because God has told us within his word that we're going to experience trials, troubles, and tribulation. But like Jesus, we will overcome. We will overcome. He does that so that the aroma of Christ is sown through us. See, we're going to go through struggles because when we go through struggles, Christ will be seen, experienced through us. It's just like with, the, with coffee. We've talked about this before. A coffee bean is just solitary by itself. Can't make coffee. What has to happen to the bean before it can make coffee? It has to be crushed. And then the hot water has to hit it, and that brings it alive. See, we have to be broken in the grinder of grace, if you will. And then that the, the hot water of his spirit hits us, and that, that circumstance, whatever it is, that hot water of circumstance brings out the aroma of Christ that it fills the room when our lives are broken for him. So we have to remember, remember that, to press on in the face of difficulty. Because think about it. If Jesus was rejected, if the disciples were rejected and go, went through trials and troubles and tribulation, what do you think is going to happen to you? Now, I'm not saying that people won't receive it. Yes, there will be people that will receive, but there will be people that reject you and the message of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen to us. British scholar N.T. Wright noted this. He said, early Christians understood their vocation as Jesus' followers, their work, to include their own suffering, misunderstanding, and likely death. He says, this is the job description of a Jesus follower, by the way. Jesus calls you to come and die so that you might live. The suffering of Jesus' followers is not just the inevitable accompaniment to the accomplishing of the divine purpose, but actually itself part of the means by which that purpose is fulfilled. In other words, the seed or, or the blood of the martyrs, as has been said, the blood of those who die for Jesus, who give their lives for Jesus, is the seed of the church. It's through our dying that others might live. I mean, it's ultimately through Jesus, through his death, but we follow in his example to suffer well so that the world might see Jesus in us. This isn't a pleasant thing to think about. This isn't what we want to hear, but this is what God has for us to hear because this is how he has ordained it. Meaning that God wants us to reach the world and suffering helps accomplish that. I know that doesn't encourage us that God has purposed our suffering, but it's through Jesus' suffering that the salvation of man was purchased. And it's through our suffering that many will see and know who Jesus is. So we're to press on in the face of difficulty, and we're to press on in the face of disappointment. And disappointment. You will see others fail. You will hear of the moral failures of those around you. 
people you felt were great teachers or leaders for God, marriages that seem to be just a wonderful testimony of God's grace will be dissolved. You'll hear about the moral failings of leaders and friends. You'll see those who are hungry for power and prosperity who turn their backs on the gospel and renounce the faith. This too is also inevitable. Jesus spoke about those who would give or experience show fruit for a time, then the cares and the things of this world will choke it. They're guilty like Balaam of doing ministry for money and greedy for gain and not for God. I've seen too many leaders, classmates of my own, fail. It's made me very pessimistic of putting my faith in leaders, but putting my faith in God alone. You're going to find that you're going to be discouraged. It can happen to anyone, and it's just all the more reason that we should pray for our leaders. So we're going to experience discouragement. We will encounter discouragement. We will also encounter disinterest. Disinterest. This is one of the most troubling and the subtlest. We'll see it on people's faces when they hear the gospel or hear of what God has done in your life. They'll say to you, well, that's good for you. And then they'll just dismiss it as if it is a psychological crutch for your life. And they're just going to put you in a category of a believer, but yet it has no room or no effect on any other aspect of life. And they're going to just push you to the side and brush you off and totally discount your faith and the change in your life. You're going to experience disinterest. And that's where you have to rely on the spirit of God. And that's where prayer takes on a greater emphasis because you cannot create within them a hunger for God unless God himself does that first. And that's only through prayer and fasting, by the way. These are the spiritual strongholds that we talk about. This is the kind when Jesus says only comes out by prayer alone. That's the only change that occur in a person's life. When you see that disinterest, that's when you get on your knees before Almighty God and ask them to cre create a hunger in them that only God can create. Because you can beg, you can cajole, you could try to instruct, exhort, shame, but only ultimately it is God that has to work in them to draw them to himself. And understand that you will encounter disinterest. And don't just buff them, don't, re don't just rebuff them, don't just, just stay away, don't, don't try to get cold in your heart because you'll be tempted to. Continue to pray for them and you'll know what happens when you start to do that. Your heart will grow hot for God. And you'll grow hot for them. And you'll want them to come to the saving knowledge of Christ to the point where you will find yourself weeping in the very presence of God, asking for their salvation and begging for it. And when you talk to that person, then that love that you have for them and what you want for them will come out. And they will see the love of Jesus in and through you. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, one of the reasons that people would come and listen to him, they said that because he's the only man that they ever heard really truly weep for the lost. He really hurt to know what their spiritual condition would be because he'd spent a great deal of time in prayer for so many people. And the reason that I think many of us don't have a heart for them is because our hearts have grown cold. We need to go back into the presence of God asking him to light that fire again with our own hearts that we might burn for his glory. So what we need to understand that we're going to experience difficulty. We're going to experience disappointment. We're going to experience discouragement. Disappointment. I didn't touch very much on disappointment, but this is when you're going to encounter people. I want to go back to that point because I skipped over it. This is one of the most paralyzing points, and it's the means by which I see so many Christians disillusioned. See, they have a grand idea for this ministry or that ministry. They share it with everyone, and everyone nods and affirms it, but then people don't begin to show up. They don't call. They don't say anything about it. And then they, they just fail to communicate with them or they just continue to do what their own thing and that person ends up disappointed and disillusioned, not wanting to do ministry anymore. You're to press on in the face of disappointment. I'm reading a book right now. It's, it's a fascinating book by a man named Samuel Chand. And it's called Leadership Pain. Leadership Pain. And he's this leadership kind of guru and he says, you'll only grow to the threshold of your pain. Meaning that you'll never be able to lead beyond your ability to handle pain. If you're to be able to lead well, you have to be able to handle pain. The pain of rejection, the pain of disappointment, the pain of misunderstanding, accusations that are coming at you. And people need to learn, we need to learn how to handle that disappointment when others fail us. And not become disillusioned 
in the process. And we need to learn also how to handle discouragement, as we mentioned before, and disinterest. And we're going to encounter the, the fifth one, discrimination. Discrimination. There will be those who discriminate you, not because of your color or because of your gender or because of your age or your education or your background, any of those things, but they're going to persecute and discriminate you because of your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. I mean, we've seen this in other countries of the world, that there are certain places, such as in Egypt, where a Christian can't hold certain offices if they are Christian. They're not allowed to in the government. But in our own country, we're seeing this start to intensify more and more. The more that we continue to hold to the scriptures, we will become more and more discriminated against. Today, for example, you are not allowed to disagree with our government on many things, especially if you're in a certain governmental position in regards to gay marriage or the transgendered. I mean, we're seeing an anti-biblical agenda being forced in our society, whether it's President Obama giving an executive mandate for all bathrooms, as we've seen this past week, to be accessible for whatever gender you think you are, or if it is opposing gay marriage, we're seeing Christians being relieved of their position in government and the military just for saying, in their personal opinion, as one soldier I just read about this past week, he was asked by his commanding officer how he felt about the subject of homosexuality. He said personally that he was against it. He was removed from his position just because of his personal conviction. Now, what are we seeing in our country? I mean, this is the frog in the kettle. We're all familiar with the frog in the kettle, I think. But if you're not, allow me to tell it, tell it to you, that if you put a boiling pot of water and you put a frog in that boiling pot of water, what happens? The frog will jump out of that water as quickly as possible. But if you take that frog and put it in just a normal pot of water, just a normal pot, and then begin to turn up the heat until it begins to boil, that frog won't jump out. Matter of fact, he'll continue to fry. He'll actually start frying himself to death, not knowing the danger that's all around him. That's where we're at as a culture right now. I don't know if you're, you understand this yet. I mean, this is the, the carbon monoxide of culture that's slowly killing us as Christians. Slowly, deftly. I mean, it's killing us softly. It's creeping into the businesses. It's creeping into our schools. It's creeping in now. I mean, this is what we have going on. And you know what? We need to have compassion, but we also need to speak truth. For those that are struggling with gender identity issues, we need to show them that Jesus is the Christ, that he has created men and women. Remember, everyone has a dent of disobedience. Every single one of us does. And we need to be gracious, not condemnatory to those that are struggling. But we must stand firmly for truth as the ability of Christians, we are in an a place where we can articulate and express our faith. We have that freedom to do so, at least right now. And that's slowly being taken away. It's going to get harder and harder. I guarantee it. It's already gotten here. I can't believe how fast we've gotten to where we are in the last generation. I am blown away, blown away at how fast it's going. I mean, and and I remember as a child hearing that this is where it was going to go. I remember sitting in church and hearing the pastor, the preacher, talk about where we were going as a culture and and saying how immorality would lead to to greater, further immorality. And it would say, they would talk about the topic of homosexuality. And then transgendered wasn't a term in the 80s, but it was talking about how it would get worse and worse. And then it would lead to bestiality and pedophilia and polygamy. We're there. We're there right now. And it's not going to get better right now until the church starts to stand up and express the truth of who Jesus is, not in a militant fashion, but come out of our little private holy huddles and express and share Jesus Christ. And as the the social capital, we start to lose our social capital, I hope that Jesus can be seen greater through us, not as a political entity, but the truth that he is the savior of the world. I hope we see that, that we're going to experience this. And people now are going to discriminate you because you are a Christian. We're seeing that in businesses. We're seeing that in schools. We're seeing now the possibility with North Carolina having federal funding removed from them if they don't comply with this bathroom mandate. You're seeing this going on, and it's going to happen. It's happening to you. It will happen to your school if it hasn't already. We have to hold on and, and again, be compassionate to be loving, to share the truth of who Jesus is for those who are struggling, but also stand firm as we do continue to experience and press on in the face of discrimination. 
I mean, we're seeing businesses being sued, Christians owned, and Christian colleges threatened with the loss of federal funding. The frog is in the kettle and the water is boiling. We must press on. We will encounter discrimination, and we're also going to encounter deception. This is one of the most painful. For those that you're closest to, sometimes that you might see someone betray you, there will be those who betray us or who will pretend to be with us to gain our trust, and they will turn away from the faith. They'll be like a Judas with Jesus. These are some of the greatest hurts to be betrayed by those closest to us. Matter of fact, you see this time and time within, again within Scripture. Here's a great example in Psalm 55. As the psalmist writes, for it's not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it's you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng, but they turned on them. Jesus even uses such an example from the Psalms in Psalm 41, 9, and he applies it to Judas. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That there's going to be betrayal. I mean, Paul even talked about that. He talked about that with a guy named Demas. And we see Demas in Colossians as a close companion of Paul. But then we see him in Timothy when Paul is saying, Demas, who is in love with this present world, he totally... He not just deserted, but he betrayed us. He left us behind. And, and being a traitor is one of the worst things in the world. Whether it's Washington being betrayed by Benedict Arnold or Caesar being stabbed by Brutus, history is lined with those who have betrayed or deceived. It's one of the worst form of betrayals. And it may be well that you might experience it. See, we may encounter deception and we may also encounter desertion. Desertion. Just as I mentioned with Paul being deserted by Demas, Jesus had been deserted by the disciples, although they came back and were repentant later. I mean, we might experience desertion when people will leave us for a time because it's just too, the cost is too great. You're going to feel that pain. We're going to have to press on in the midst of that hurt. It's going to be hard. I mean, hear the words of Elizabeth Elliot. If many of you don't know her. Her husband... Uh, Jim Elliott had been martyred by the Alca Indians in Ecuador in the, uh, the mid-20th century. She wrote this because it's going to be painful. She says, I'm not a theologian or a scholar, but I'm very aware of the fact that pain is necessary to all of us. In my own life, I think I can honestly say that out of the deepest pain has come the strongest conviction of the presence of God and the love of God, that even in the middle of betrayal, in the middle of deception, in the middle of desertion, know that God is still working. He is faithful to you. Even though that person might have left, left you behind, God will still be faithful to you to hold on, to press on, that he's going to use that pain to draw you closer to him. Now, what do we do? I mean, this isn't exactly inspiring, Matter of fact, some of you are going, I just, this is depressing. Well, it can be. And no, like I said, no one said the Christian life is going to be easy. I mean, how do we even deal with those who are going to, to, to not handle, receive this word of truth that God has within his word? How do we respond to those people? How do we respond to those who call themselves brothers and pick and choose, they cherry pick which parts of the Bible they want to follow and the parts that they do not? How do we deal with them? Well, Paul has a word for us because he knew that that was going to happen. Look at verse 14. Paul writes, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. What Paul there is calling us to do is practice tough love. Practice tough love. That's what he's calling us to do. That if we're to press on, it also means practicing tough love. Now, how do we practice tough love? First of all, it involves the right authority. The right authority. Notice he says, does not obey what we say in this letter. Paul's words were, were God-inspired. They were authoritative. We don't practice tough love by, based on our own issues, preferences, prejudices, ag or agendas, but on the truth revealed through the word of God of who God is. God's word must be our authority, and it's that authority that acts as the sieve for everything else. We have to have the right authority. No, notice also that it involves the right admonition admonition. Look at verse 15. We are to warn as a brother. It means to reason with someone by appealing to a higher authority. It's to be through instruction and the warning is an appeal to the mind through or with scripture. Now notice this is not an unbeliever. This is a person who is considered to be a Christian, a brother or sister in Christ. 
It's to be through instruction and the warning is an appeal to the mind through or with scripture. It's exerting positive pressure by urging them to choose or to turn to God's best. It doesn't just mean chastising or rebuking, but it may mean admonishing, correcting, and exhorting them to choose God's best. We must actually care enough to confront them with the truth of God's word, not just let them go their way. We confront them not as someone who is self-righteous, but who is a brother, one who is part of the family. We don't treat them as an enemy, but as a fellow believer. And we, because we know that we are susceptible to the same kinds of temptations and things that they are. And we must be aware of what they are going through. And we treat them as we would want to be treated in that situation. We must make sure that we have the right attitude as we go about it. We have to have the right authority. We must make sure we speak those words of an admonition, but we also must have the right attitude as we go about it. We get a great picture of this, the attitude that we're to have in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, where Paul writes, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. So it's someone who is taught, caught. I mean, they got caught up in it. You who are spiritual, you love the Lord, should restore him. The, the goal here is not condemnation, but it's restoration. It's not humiliation. It's restoration. Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. But keep watch over yourself. Understand that you yourself, as you're helping that brother, that you yourself might be tempted in the same way. If there is sin that they're struggling with, come alongside them, but be careful. For example, let me, let me give you a quick example. If you struggled with alcoholism, you might be an alcoholic, and you see someone who is a brother in Christ who has gone into that. You have to be careful as you go to talk to them about Jesus because you might see that all around you, and you might, you might be drawn back into that life. So you have to be careful of it. And that can translate to any arena, by the way. That's just one example. So we have to be aware of that. should restore them gently. We have to have the right attitude as we go about it. But here's where the tough love comes in in verse 14. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. Literally means make a mark of them, make them distinct, make them set apart, take note of them, and then have nothing to do with them. This is where it gets tough. The idea there is not intermixing in intimate fellowship. You might have to see them on a day-to-day -day basis. They could be in your family. They could be in your work. They could be in your school. You might have to do something with them, but you're not to have intimate fellowship with them. Now, this is where we talked a little bit about last week. We see Jesus dining with sinners, but we also saying that those who consider themselves brothers that refuse to obey God's word, they have a different standard. So he eats with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes and engages with them in the hope that they might come to know who Jesus is and see and understand the mercy of God. But for those who consider themselves brothers and sisters in Christ who refuse to obey what God's word, they have a different standard they're held against. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Five, allow me to show this to you. And first he begins with verse three through five. And, and, and I can give you the preceding verses, but directly preceding this, Paul is rehearsing a case that he had received. A man had slept with his stepmother. Okay? And, he, he, and Paul says, no, this is how you should treat this guy. This is a guy who's going to your church and you guys are boasting and proud about it. Like, hey, way to go. And he's saying, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be proud of this. You should be ashamed of this. And he says, this is how you're to treat this guy. For though I am absent in the body, I'm present in spirit. And, and as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, which we're doing right now, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord Jesus is here with us, by the way, as we come to be gathered in his name. You are to deliver this man to Satan. What? I'm to what? That seems pretty cruel there, Paul. He's saying, no, no, no. You got to hand them over. So they'll come to the heir of their ways. The blessing of God is going to be withdrawn from them so that they can come to the end of themselves and repent. Because, why? Because those who do these things actively participate in them. There's no repentance in it. They're living a lifestyle of it. They're living in a state of it. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Period. End of story. Paul lays it out. He says, do you not know that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God? Not that they've never done them, all right? We all have done things that we're not proud of, but it's living in a state of it. They're not repentant of it. 
he says, you are to deliver this man over to Satan, to the enemy for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. And then he skips down a couple verses. In verse 9, and I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. There's this letter that he had read to them before that is now lost. He says, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. Not unbelievers. If that's the case, you got to go out of the world. Not that. Or, and he says, not just about the sexual arena. Let me broaden this a little bit. The greedy, the swindlers, idolaters. Since, since then you need to go out of the world. He lays it out. He says, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Present tense. Again, present tense. Not that, not that you've never done those things. Not to say that you're not going to struggle. Not to say that you've not had a fall. But the question is, are you repentant? That's the question. Are you repentant? If you are broken, then you are okay. If you come back to God, God, I'm ashamed. I am broken. Have mercy on me, a sinner. You are good. But if you're a person that says, you know what? I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. Then you're not good. That's the, the state of it. Or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat. The reason he says that is because eating was a sign of close fellowship, especially within the ancient world. And it is that way today. If you have food with someone, you're eating together, that's an intimate fellowship that you're having with one another. That's why we tell you, by the way, to invite one another into your homes, to get to know people. Are you doing that, by the way? I don't see all this. It's not just come in, get your spiritual fix, and go on your way. It's living in community. It's breaking down the barriers. It's inviting someone that's different than you are yourself into your home and eating with them. I sure hope that we're doing that. It'd be a tragedy not to. We're to experience and offer hospitality more than any other group on the face of the planet. And I feel as Americans, especially American Christians, we're not doing a very good job of that. Because hospitality means having people in your home. For what is it that I have to do with judging outsiders? It's not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. God has the unbelievers. I'm dealing with the believers. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Why? And he says this later in the text. He says, a little leaven, yeast, goes through the entire loaf. A little bit of sin tolerated in the body will then permeate and everybody will think, I'm okay, they're not going to, that big a deal, they're letting him do it, why can't I? That's the point of it. This is the tough love. We have to have the right action, which means we're to have nothing to do with it so that they might be ashamed, ashamed. And it means, the word ashamed here means to turn one's attention to something in a riveted way that they will then pay attention. Wait a minute. Why are they disassociating themselves with me right now? Because see, there was a close intimate fellowship with it that was there before. See, the hard part is, is, and this is what I've experienced in this church. We have people that just slowly begin to go to the fringes of the community because they don't have interpersonal relationships with other people. And then they go off into some kind of sin, but no one notices because that they've never been brought into community, truly. That's something that we have to fix greatly. Greatly. We have to have the right action. They have to, to turn their own attention. That's why they might feel ashamed that they might address the sin in their life. And it denotes, by the way, a wholesome shame that leads a man to consideration of his condition, a reevaluation so as to reveal the extent of their salvation. As it is, they're behaving in such a way that shows they're not recipients of salvation. But we are to hope bring them back that they might reconsider it and enter into that life that God has for them. Now, Paul continues his thought in verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you a peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. How does God give peace? How does God give you peace? How does he give you peace? I ask myself that question. May God give you peace. Is it just a peace that he comes to ourselves? The only passage that I could really, really put a place where there's a means by which God gives us peace is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. Paul writes by the Spirit, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the idea of peace there is you have requests, you have burdens on your heart, you lay them before God, you're not to be anxious about them, but as you release them to God, God will flood you with his peace. And I believe that God is calling us here to be in prayer at all times. He's calling us to pray. That's how we get peace, is through praying and, and releasing those things to God. So he's saying pray at all times. Times. That's the next point for you to write down. Pray at all times. Now, why do we pray? Notice it is to give us peace. In other words, it keeps us calm. Keeps us calm. We don't get ratcheted up about all the circumstances and things and stresses that are going on in our life. We keep calm. Matter of fact, we'll have such a peace that when we face trouble, trials, and tribulations, um, fear will dissipate. For most of us, though, it's the opposite. Fear begins to multiply. But when we release these things to God, God's peace floods us. And then we can say, truly, as the psalmist said in Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff will comfort me. See, we can say that. Once we release those things to God, then his peace comforts us even as we face the shadow of death. Even as we face great, face great trials and tribulations, we will remain calm that God is there with us. Now notice what Paul says in verse 17 of our text. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. Now, why did Paul write that? He wanted them to see that his letter was legitimate. Remember, they had received some false letters that were supposedly written by Paul, but Paul here wants them to examine that letter and to say that it's not really his, but this one is because it has his signature on it. You see, what, another thing he's saying there is that when we stop to pray, we're not only kept calm, but we're also given clarity. When we take that time to pray, we can see what is real and what is trustworthy and what is false and what is to be discarded. We're not to just listen to those who teach, but we're to check the scriptures to see if it, what is said and taught is true and then ask God. He gives clarity. It may take some time and some honesty, but he'll show you. And then we end our letter in verse 18. Verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You know, I love it when Paul ends his letters with this. Why? Because he knew and understood that we're going to need grace. He knew how hard it would be. He knew that we would struggle, that we would fail, and that we'd feel like we had failed God and that God was going to condemn us. But he also wanted us to understand that there, there is, therefore, no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but that we have grace. And our salvation is not based on our works, but it's on, upon God's grace alone. And it's, again, it's a reminder that it's entirely of God, God and him alone, working in and through us. And though we may fail, God's purpose will still go forward. And that should help give us confidence. That should give us confidence. God's grace should give us confidence. To know that there's a, a safety net there for us. When we realize that salvation is entirely of grace and not of works, we can have confidence. When we realize that, that when we fail, God's grace is there to prop us up, then we can have confidence. Well, we've come to the end. I've hoped we finished well. First and second Thessalonians are about us being ready for all that God has for us. It may mean suffering in the here and now, but it also means knowing that he is coming and we need to be ready for it. He is coming soon. We need to be ready and we need to finish well. We don't want to quit. And as soon as we do, he'll, he'll come back and we'll feel shame. But if you press on, you keep up in the fight, knowing that he sees, he sees you and he will see and give you all the strength and power by and through his presence in us to do all things that he has for us to be and to do that will give us hope, confidence, and a surety of a great life in the here and now and what is to come. Let's close our message time in prayer. Our Father and our God, we're reminded of all that you have for us. Lord, we're reminded of the great message of the gospel, that you gave your son to die on the cross for our sins, and it's through him that we have eternal life. And then we're not to, to deviate from that message, but we might finish well. We might continue in our proclamation, telling other people about who Jesus is and what he has done in order to provide for our, our redemption. And that the kingdom of God has been started within the hearts of so many different men and women. It will continue on in us. May we be faithful.
May we press on into the end. May we continue to praise you until we take our last breath, whether that means dying or it means being ready for you to come and entering into your presence forevermore. Lord, help us to see that this life is but the warm-up act, but we'll be spending eternity in your presence forevermore. Lord, please glorify your name in our lives. Encourage those who are weary. Help them to keep on and press on. Give them encouragement and strength to continue to do and sharing the name and, and word of Jesus Christ. Continue to battle sin, to continue to tell people even when they're in the face of great hostility. Lord, help us to see that our hope and our life is in you and through you. For your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.